Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, October 25th, 2020. I'm your lay reader, Zach Coser. Uh, I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the description below this video on Facebook and on YouTube, or you can find it on our website, www.centralprespb.com. Look for the publications link at the top, scroll down to find today's date, click it and uh, download the PDF for the bulletin, and then go ahead and print that out for today's service. Now that you have the bulletin for today's service, uh, I ask you that you turn your attention to the announcements found on the back of that bulletin. Neighbor to Neighbor has asked us to deliver 50, uh, for a donation, I should say, uh, 50 uh, cans of cranberry sauce um, by the this Friday for them to distribute for Thanksgiving, and then an additional 50 cans by November 23rd to distribute for Christmas. Uh, if you uh, would, if we, we ask you that you uh, um, drop those off directly to neighbor to neighbor. If you need some help getting your cans, feel free to contact, via social, contact us via social media and we'll go ahead and uh, help you get those cans to neighbor to neighbor. Uh, we wanted to remind everyone that it is stewardship season. Uh, look for your pledge cards in the coming weeks uh, via your postal mail. Uh, please return them as soon as possible so the session can prepare a budget for 2021. Uh, I'm going to remind everyone that Dominic Munn is participating in a, a contest with other youth across the presbytery. He needs donations of non-perishable food items and books for his blessing box in Grady. If you're interested in helping out, please contact us via social media and we'll point you in the right direction. The general election is coming up on November 3rd. CPC will be again a polling place uh, for our community. Please be aware of election rules if you plan on being in the building on that Tuesday. If you'd like more information about voting itself, please head to www.pcusa.org slash vote. You can also find that link on our social media channels and our uh, website in the coming days. The session of CPC has decided to stick with virtual services for the foreseeable future. Please keep in contact us uh, with, with us via social media username Central Press PB, or on our websites for announcements about any special services and when we plan on returning to in-person worship. Uh, finally, archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and on YouTube. Links to each are on our website, www.centralpresspb.com. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all, all our days. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper the work of our hands O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Let us worship God. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Please join us for the prayer of confession, first uh, using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. And now silently. Amen. As people born of the water and the spirit, we have died to the old life and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now let's go ahead and turn it over to Rose Von Tullen for this week's children's sermon. 
Good morning, everyone. It's a little chilly this morning, isn't it? I guess that means it's getting close to fall. This, this week I've been thinking about love. How we should love each other and do things to help each other. And you know, there's lots of songs out there about love, but I think the one I like the most is Jesus Loves Me. Can you help me sing it? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to me belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Y'all did a good job. I can even hear you at my house. And while we're talking about love, I want to tell you a story that Jesus talked about love. So what I want you to do is kind of help me out with this story. Every time you hear me say the word love, I want you to make a heart. Can you make a heart with your hands? Okay, here we go. One day, while Jesus was out preaching, some of the scribes came up to Jesus and was going to try to trick him and see what he would say by asking him a question. And they asked him, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus said, you shall love your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. And the second commandment is like that. You should love your neighbors as yourself. So Jesus was telling us that if we loved each other and if we loved others just like we do ourselves, then we would be following all the commandments and we wouldn't be breaking any. So remember the next time you hear the word love in a song, think about what Jesus said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, help us to love one another as we ought to. Help others to learn your love that we may see your love through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good Thanks, Rose, for that great children's sermon. Now let's go ahead and turn it over to Reverend Tim Reeves for this week's uh, sermon, The Authentic Witness. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica, beginning with the second chapter at verse 1 and proceeding through verse 8. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed. We did not seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Our second reading comes from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 31st verse and proceeding through verse 46. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. 
when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear. That hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. A number of years ago, a delightful little book called The Good News from North Haven, A Year in the Life of a Small Town, written by a Presbyterian minister by the name of Michael Lindvall, was published. And the book explores some of the more humorous, poignant, and even touching moments that are often part and parcel of ministering to the people of God. Though it's a work of fiction, it expresses profound truth in its pages. One of the chapters is entitled The Jefferson Street Leaf War, and it tells of a pastor walking home late one night in October after a rather lengthy session meeting when this pastor encountered Alvina Johnson, a longtime member of the church who, under the cover of darkness, had sorted through the leaves that had accumulated in her yard and was caught in the act of dumping a load of leaves over her fence into her neighbor's yard. Linval then writes that she said, they're the London's leaves, Pastor. They're off their big oak over there. She pointed an accusatory finger at the red oak behind the pastor in the London's front yard. The slightest breeze from the west and half of them blow into my property. I know they belong to them because I only have the one maple in the back. I sort them out, of course. I mean, I keep all the maple leaves. I figure they're mostly mine, but the oak leaves are theirs. It's only fair, pastor. There was an edge of defensiveness in Alvina's voice, London, or Linval writes. If she'd been altogether comfortable with this bizarre justice, she would hardly be executing it just before midnight when all the other people on Jefferson Street, most notably the Londons, were in their beds. It was late and the pastor could not think of anything to say, so he simply said, good night, Alvina don't work too hard. But he should have known and wasn't surprised when three days later, Alvina knocked at his door and asked if she could have a moment of his time. She removed her hat, her gloves and coat, and she sat decisively in the chair on the other side of the desk facing the pastor and asked him, is there anything in scripture about people being responsible for their own plants and animals? 
I know that the Old Testament has lots of rules about sheep and goats and whose fields are whose, but is there anything that might apply to my leaf situation? Alvina informed the, the, the pastor that Ollie London had just yesterday returned the oak leaves. It took me hours to rake and sort them, and he just dumped them back in broad daylight, Pastor. And not only his oak leaves, but quite a few of his maple leaves, too. I was going to ask her how, or the pastor was going to ask her how she knew those maple leaves belonged to the Londons, but decided not to step into that legal thicket. But Alvina must have guessed the direction that the pastor was thinking and in the heat of righteous indignation told him something she probably had not planned to reveal. She sat up straighter in her chair and said, this past summer I hired Danny Olson to go up in my tree and mark all my leaves. He put an X on each one of them with a magic marker. It only took him two days. This, she said, allowed her to tell whose maple leaves belong or were her responsibility and whose were someone else's. I think Linval really captures in that scene how easily we can become wrapped up in our own selves. I mean, imagine how ludicrous it would be to pay someone to mark all the leaves that are your responsibility and then to take the time to rake up all those leaves and to separate them out into piles of yours and theirs and then gather up theirs and dump them in their yard. Quite honestly, you would spend more time and money doing that than it would take to rake up and dispose of all the leaves in your yard. Imagine how ludicrous it is when we apply that same kind of thinking to other areas of our lives. I mean, <clears throat> we all fall prey to such thinking. We spend a lot of time and energy marking others with our own mental magic markers as if in doing so we can somehow distinguish those to whom we are and are not obliged. We look at others who do not live the kind of lives we think they should be living and conclude that they must be beyond the reach of God's love and therefore beyond our concern. But is that the truly authentic witness of the Church of Jesus Christ? Is it not more truthful to say that Jesus' claim when each of our lives compels us to take the fullest extent of God's love shown to each one of us and to extend that same love not only to God but to everyone and everything God has made. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now those may very well have been some of the least controversial words Jesus ever spoke in his life. Because any Jew who knew the Hebrew scriptures would have known that Loving God was, in fact, the greatest commandment, and that loving one's neighbor was a cr critical component of fulfilling the law as well. So when Jesus was asked which commandment in the law is the greatest, he wasn't concerned about giving an original or even a creative answer. He wasn't trying to break new ground. Rather, his emphasis was on whether or not people were actually living their lives in such a way as to leave no doubt that they loved God with their whole being and they loved their neighbors as, their, as themselves. That is, after all, the life that Jesus lived. 
he proclaimed the good news wherever he went, telling the people that God's reign was near, calling them to accountability and responsibility. He brought more than this message to the people he encountered, however. He also brought concrete actions of love. Again and again, we read about how he showed compassion and reached out to others. He would even go so far as to lay down his life for his own people. This is the life we are to emulate. This is the love we are to exhibit. Because it is in doing as well, it is in the doing as well as in the saying that we render an authentic witness to our lives of faith. <clears throat> I'm reminded of some words uttered by John Chrysostom, one of the preachers in the early days of the church, who instructed his congregation on how to win over unbelievers. He said, let us astound them by our way of life. Though we give 10,000 precepts in words, if we do not exhibit a far better life, we gain nothing. It is not what is said that draws their attention, but what we do. Let us win them, therefore, by our life which I think is an apt summary of what Paul was writing to the Christians in the church in Thessalonica. Or Thessalonica. Because while Paul is speaking of himself in these verses, I believe he outlines three important aspects that should mark every Christian's life and witness. Moreover, Though he doesn't expressly use these words, I believe what Paul is saying in these verses, in very concrete terms, illustrates what it means to love God and neighbor. First, he asserts, though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. Now, Paul does not elaborate here on the suffering or shameful mistreatment that had been his lot in Philippi, but the book of Acts does. Acts tells us that while they were in Philippi, Paul and Silas were brought before the magistrates, stripped of all their clothing, beaten with rods, and then thrown into prison. Such opposition and persecution were not uncommon experiences for Paul, and so it did in fact take great courage to declare the gospel of God in the face of such opposition. And that holds true in many places around the world today, because there are places in this world where Christians are still persecuted for proclaiming the gospel of God and yet they do so courageously. Contrast that to us, who live in a country where we are not likely to be imprisoned or beaten or killed for being a Christian, and yet we are often reticent to proclaim anything. Don't you find that odd that we, who have so little to fear, are afraid to exhibit our love of God publicly? Why is that? What's holding us back? What are we afraid of? Now I know we tend not to want to admit our deepest fears to one another, but as long as we refuse to confront our fears, they will continue to exert power over us. And as long as we live in fear, we cannot say that we love God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind, and so our witness will never be authentic. Because if we give in to our fears, we will never exhibit integrity or vulnerability, 
the other aspects of the Christian life that Paul discusses in these verses. First, regarding integrity, Paul writes, our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext of greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others. We speak not to please mortals, but to please God, Paul writes. Ours is the noble task and great privilege to tell a sinful and broken world what we all need to hear, not what we all want to hear. Ours is the responsibility to point to our need for salvation and then point to our Savior, Jesus Christ, instead of saying to the world, I'm okay, you're okay. Ours is the calling to walk a straight and narrow way, rather than going along with others in order to get along. But this does not mean we are to do so without love or compassion in our hearts. This is hardly an excuse to beat people over the head or to pass judgment on others, because as the American journalist and social activist Dorothy Day rightly said, we only love God as much as the person we love the least. And so Paul would also stress being vulnerable. He wrote, we were gentle among you, like a nurse, tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Our own selves, says Paul. That means we follow our Lord's example, willingly laying down our lives for others. It means we commit ourselves not only to be open to the sufferings of others, but that we also commit ourselves to stand with them in that suffering. It means that we commit ourselves not only to meeting the needs of the hungry, but that we also commit ourselves to addressing the underlying issues of greed and injustice, which lead to poverty and hunger in the first place. It means that we commit ourselves not only to caring for the oppressed, but that we also care for the oppressors. It means that we commit ourselves to loving God and neighbor, in all that we are, in all that we say, and all that we do. For it is then that the Church of Jesus Christ gives its truest and most authentic witness. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I want to ask now at this time you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and our offerings, which will again be taken electronically this week by using the Donate Now link on our website, www.centralprespb.com. If you prefer not to uh, give electronically, uh, we welcome all uh, tithes and offerings sent via mail to 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day, when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this, now, at this time, we will now share our joys and concerns, which there are uh, several. Um, we uh, continue to uh, hold uh, Miss Jane Glover, who is a neighbor of my wife and mine, um, in prayer. She is uh, continuing to uh, recover from a broken hip. Um, we also ask that uh, for prayer for the family of David Shapiro, who uh, unfortunately passed away uh, this past week. Um, we uh, continue to keep uh, Brad uh, Von Tungland in our prayers. Um, he is doing much better. Um, and uh, we will continue to keep um, the family of uh, Isaac Patillo, uh, who passed away a little over a week ago, in our prayers as well. Um, we will continue to keep Anita Rodriguez in our prayers. Um, we will continue to keep Emil and Carol Brown in our prayers as well. Um, uh, both are going through medical uh, issues, even though Anita did get a good report last week. I haven't heard any updates on her as well. Um, for, for more information about more prayer concerns, uh, I direct you to uh, look at the bulletin. Um, there are uh, plenty of people in, in the congregation and friends of the congregation who are in need of prayer. Uh, as is the custom, um, recently, we will continue to keep the, uh, those first responders, our medical professionals, in our prayers uh, as they deal with COVID-19. Uh, we continue to keep the nation um, and the world in prayer over COVID-19. Um, we are seeing a, a, an increase in cases. We're almost to our, back to our midsummer highs. Um, we pray that those who have been lost to COVID-19, that we, uh, that you are with um, those families, that you pray for those families and let them know that uh, the Lord is there with them. Uh, we also continue to uh, pray for the reconciliation of the world to the Lord. Um, there is um, time, like I said last week, uh, time is coming to make important decisions and um, and I pray that we do God's will in this world and in this country and with our decision-making processes in the coming days. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Please be with those who we mentioned uh, previously. Uh, please continue to bless our nation. Uh, please give us the wisdom and the guidance to do your will in the coming days with the decisions that we will be making as a uh, community and as a nation. Uh, please be with those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. Uh, please be with those and heal those who have uh, contracted this horrible disease. Uh, please be with those who uh, are on the front lines dealing with it, our medical professionals, our police and first responders, and our, <clears throat> our retail workers who are uh, dealing with uh, people every day. Uh, please be with the family of David Shapiro who lost uh, Mr. Shapiro this last week. I continue to be with the family of Isaac Patillo. 
Uh, please continue to be with Emil and Carol Brown, Anita Rodriguez and Brad Von Tunglin, who are all dealing with medical issues. <clears throat> and um, we thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.